Welcome to the 18th episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 11th of October 2010, and in this episode we're going to review Maverick Meerkat and listen to an interview with Tim Dobson about Young Rewired State, recorded at OpenTech last month. We will of course cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, command line love, and go over all of your feedback. I'm Tony, and with me this week is, well, it's there's four of us here. Um, seems to be uh, it seems it's been a while since we've been in the studio, given our Dublin trip last time. Oh, yeah. um, but Alan's here with me again. Hello, hello. How are you? All right? Yeah, tickety boo. Thank you. Good, good, good. And what have you been up to lately? Um, well, what with Maverick, as we've been talking about, we're going to talk about. Mm. Um, I've been playing with that and finding a few bugs and chasing a few bugs. Um, a couple of my favourite ones um, was uh, the bug where the um, the trash or recycle bin was called something different all over the place. In three different places or something. Yeah, yeah, I actually got a screenshot with it having four different names on the screen at the same time. Nice. Yeah, so found a bug and um, the translation people, the doc team made a decision on what it would be called. And this is only in British English. Right. So we've decided it's called a rubbish bin now, not trash, not, okay. not recycle bin, not like ice that. basket. It's a rubbish bin. Mm-hmm. And um, is that going to come out in an update? No, it's, it's done. It's, it's done. done. Oh, right, okay. I mean, in the in the release candidate, I think it was still right. um, inconsistent in various places. In fact, I think Tux Radar reviewed it and they pointed that out, ah. that it was a bit inconsistent. But luckily it all went through and now it's definitely called the rubbish bin. I think there's only one place left that it's not. Right. Well, that's just rubbish. Um, and Laura is here as well. Hello. How are you? All right? All right, thank you. Just made it here from the train station. Yes, well done. Dedication. Yes, yeah. And uh, what have you been up to? Um, I went to see Doctor Who live yesterday. Oh, yes. Live at Wembley. Yeah. With you. With me, I know. With yeah. you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's all for effect. It was very good. It was very good. Lots of monsters and Cybermen. But hang on, David monsters Tennant was on telly last night. How can he have been live? He's not the Doctor anymore for a start. Oh, yeah. There is that. And, and even Matt Smith wasn't live. Oh. Um, Nigel Planer was. Huh? He was in it. Not yeah. playing the Doctor, playing another character. The do- yeah. It's quite complex. It is. There's lots of monsters, basically. It's basically uh, uh, either a rip-off or uh, an homage, as they say in French, to uh, the 1970s... Do they really? Do the French really say that? They do that? say that, yes. Right. Um, to the 1973 story, The Carnival of Monsters. Um, you know that story quite well, don't you? I've seen it once or twice. Right. Establishing my geek credentials. And um, rejoining us, Glutton for Punishment. Um, he clearly didn't... Uh, get, get too much, yeah, <laughs> too much negative feedback after the last time. Is Mark, who's, who's just sat on his sofa? How you Hello, doing? I'm yeah, very well, thank you. Sat in my spot. Yeah. <laughs> a, a lot of love for you after the last episode. Well, can't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the ego has landed. Eh? <laughs> and so, what have you been doing, Mark? Um, I finally upgraded my work machine from I think I was running Jaunty to Lucid. Um, oh yeah with a slight bump along the road but i managed to fix that and now it's all working very smoothly so you've just upgraded to 910 no oh, sorry 10, 10, 10 lts right. yes yeah, sorry yes you're right are you gonna stick on lts um yeah because it's at work i never have the chance to upgrade really which is why i've waited so long because i don't i can't really have any downtime when i can't be there to develop if i need to right so um, that's why i've not gone before now and now that John T was being end of life this month, I think. Yeah, if I've got that right, eighteen months, 18 isn't months? It? Yeah, yeah, that'd be about right. Um, I figured I'd better do it, otherwise I'd end up with an unsupported system. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you also bought. You went to the lug meeting. And yes, we popped my... along, and you bought a bit of kit that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, my uh, Guru plug server from Global Scale, um, which was having problems connecting to the network, but when I got it home, it worked fine again. So I've been setting that up and doing all sorts of fun servery things because I've never had an always on machine before. So, it's a, it's a, quite a small form factor. Yeah, it literally um, looks like a Ethernet over mains adapter. And so everything's sort of within that housing. It's like a system on chip with um, gigabit Ethernet port, wireless, um, Bluetooth and USB, uh, sort of all in one little thing. And it's quite pretty and has nice flashy little lights. Which, what, uh, what architecture is it? Is it ARM? It's ARM, yeah. Ooh, so oh. very low power. Yeah, um, running on Debian, stable. Both Tony and Mark at this point are making small box shapes with their hands just to show you exactly how <laughs> yeah, small just, this just, thing is. Yeah, just just to oh, give you all listeners a picture. Yeah. Oh, like this. that? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh cylindrical. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, you could fit a square item in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah, you're, you're, you're gesturing that or gesturicating or whatever the word was. Gesturicating. Yeah. <laughs> Gesticulating wildly. Gesturing. That's it. And so, Tony, what have you been up to? Um, <laughs> I'm sure I've been doing some geeky things. Um, 
I found out my old school runs Ubuntu. I went yeah. back for a memorial service, one of my old teachers, and uh, chatting to the head of IT, who was head of IT when I was there and is still head of IT now. And, it's nice um, when nothing changes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they're running Ubuntu on some netbooks and stuff there, so that's nice. quite cool. Um, but mostly I've been doing a lot of running because I'm doing the, the Great South Run in well, just under two weeks um, as this podcast comes out. That's a 10-mile run in Southampton, something like uh, in Portsmouth, sorry, and that's 24,000 runners or something. Wow. So I'm going to be one of those. So uh, watch out on Channel 5. I think it's on live. Oh, is it really? Is it yeah. going to be on telly? Yeah. I don't think it's just following me. I think it might be following <laughs> oh, okay. people. Oh, that's boring. But I'm doing it for Help the Hospices. And if you uh, would like to sponsor me, um, it's all in a good cause. It's all for charity. You can go to Just Giving dot com slash tony whitmore and uh, any little amount that you can give um is uh, is very welcome for a good cause end of shill end of shill yes <laughs> i don't like to talk about my charity work <laughs> <laughs> except to the few thousand people who download this podcast exactly you know it's all a good cause yeah absolutely that's it i think we can get on with the show so yesterday was the 10th of the 10th of the 10th um, mm. Which was the day that... Or, if you're in America, the 10th of the 10th of the 10th. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> they do it the other way around, don't they? Um, and that was the release date for Ubuntu Maverick. Yes. And it's quite good, I think. Yes. I've been running Maverick for several hours now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you upgrade or clean install? You know, upgrade. Upgrade. Well, I've been running the development version, so it was oh, a, probably okay. a couple of months out of date. So it was an upgrade to the what final sort of, release version. What sort of machine was it on? Uh, a laptop. Okay. Um, quite a reasonably good laptop, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's looking pretty sweet. Yeah, they got rid of the blobby wallpaper, and it's now a sort of mushy wallpaper. Yes, <laughs> it is. It's less blob, more mush. Yes. Are you, Can't uh, wait. Have you tried Maverick at all? I haven't. No. Okay. I was learning statistics instead today. Okay, oh, good. That's not a good excuse. No. Mark, have you tried? I've tried both um, Ubuntu and Kubuntu on VirtualBox just quickly, just to see uh, what had changed. Ah, oh, interesting. Excellent. Okay, so what is new and good and wonderful in the latest release? It's a new slideshow. Um, the installer has changed again. Um, so it's got like a, a new kind of set of screenshots and stuff. I really like the slideshow. I thought it's the nice. information it gave about each bit was a lot more sort of useful to users than mm. just saying, well... Our computer, was, your computer yeah. software is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. that was sort of what it said before. But now it's, you know, these are what you get. And this is the other things you can install, which do good yeah, jobs cool. as well. So it says, like, how the GIMP is available if you want it. Right. <laughs> yeah, for Just the for Fab. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't like to say, but yeah. Um, and also, it starts installing before you finish answering the questions. Oh, yeah. what would be you saying about that? That was a bit freaky for yeah, me. It's yeah, it's a bit But, but it's, it's quite, once you know it does that, it's quite cool that you can, like, you know, you've got mm. a little progress bar going on the bottom of the screen while you're typing in your name. It's quite cool. So what kind of things do you have to put in before it even starts? Uh, which disk you want to install it on. Oh. There's not much in the language. That's about there's, it. There's not many options, though, are there? No, not really. Um, what else we got? Um, oh, Rhythmbox has got a feature where you can tweet what you're listening to. <laughs> that couldn't be annoying in any way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I used it once to demonstrate that you right. can tweet what you're listening to, and I haven't used it again since. This is the sort of thing that people were doing on IRC years ago. It was having automatic status updates that said what you were listening to and everybody got annoyed and kicked yeah. people for it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i suppose it's, it's harder for them to kick people from twitter mm. just unfollow. you can block people from twitter yeah mm. and you say that links into the ubuntu one music store as well yeah it gives you a link if you if you if you um if you're listening to a song you can press a button and it will find it in the music store and you can press a button to say you know i'm listening to this song and it will provide a link in the tweet that links directly to the music store to try and encourage other people to buy it from the music oh, store. Okay. If they're yeah. using Ubuntu. Yeah. If they're using Ubuntu. I don't know what it mm. can, what happens if you're not using Ubuntu, whether you just get a broken link or something. I don't it know. just downloads an ISO for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and begins to install it before you finish answering ISO. the questions. <laughs> <laughs> would be cool. Mm. Uh, not. No, not at all. And the shot well, of course, the new photo manager, replacing mm. F-Spot. Mm. Mm. Mixed reviews, really. I've not used it in anger. I've imported some photos into it, and it was pretty quick, mm. and it felt very like iPhoto, oh, like right. the, ni the the nice bits of iPhoto where you can, you know, you just say import all the photos, and it says, oh well, there might be duplicates, and it ignores the duplicates, and yeah, seemed to work. That's what he said was the, his big push was to make it quick and do well, the import. Well, it's Bruno Green. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, one at least one photographer friend of mine who I've spoken to has sort of said, well, it's got some promise, but seems to be missing quite a few features over F-Spot. And I know we talked yeah. when we interviewed him, we, they were talking about it is slightly different audiences. 
Yeah. But um, perhaps for more sophisticated photographers or whatever, they're going to stick with F-Spot for a while, I guess. And it's F-Spot's still in the repository. Of course, so, yeah. yeah. It's just the mm. default app. Mm. And there's been the usual sort of upgrades to all the core no, no maps and stuff, like Evolution and whatever. Not that I use it. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'd be interested to know if uh, Thunderbird 3 is any more stable on, on under Maverick. Mm. I have a lot of problems with that. It's interesting because there was a discussion recently online where... Um, Mark Shuttleworth got involved in a blog post uh, yeah. about the fact that they might consider switching from Evolution. Oh, to I remember, yeah, seeing the Ooh. post. Yeah, yeah. I thought at the same time, oh, I hope they fix all the problems before <laughs> they do that and made it less dog slow. Mm. But yeah, but it couldn't be as slow as Evolution. Evolution's got a lot quicker. Has it? Yeah, I find. I, I, I've never had a problem with it. Everyone keeps telling me it crashes lots, and I don't get that. Yeah. I don't know why. It doesn't crash as much as K mail. <laughs> oh, right, this is the whole extra field of crashiness we've got in, introduced into yeah. the show i still prefer k-mail but it does crash a lot it brings mm. us bring a lot more variety doesn't it <laughs> yeah we've got extra apps that could crash yeah <laughs> they all begin with k <laughs> oh, all of them no, all of the ones that crash one of them oh, begins the with an ones. a and ends with a capital k Amarok. Amarok. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we all knew that one you could play Hangman. <laughs> the UK podcast Hangman. What app? <laughs> That's so sad. Um, save, yeah, save that for the old camp live show. <laughs> We've got the new font. Oh, yes. Oh, or have we? Yes, we have. Is it completely finished? No. Right. Oh. So when you say we've got it, British... Well, we, there are, the font is there. The font is there. Um, oh, I see. And it, but the UI is using it. Yep, it's it the default be. font for certain elements. Not everything. So it'll be okay. for um, the desktop user interface um i think not for documents so if you go into on a standard ubuntu install if you go to settings preferences appearance uh, sorry system preferences appearance Mm -hmm. um and then fonts you can see that there's lots of categories for where the font is used and not documents oh right okay i don't know why is it not as readable perhaps as some of the planar fonts because it has got a certain i mean it's great for short uh, dialogues and stuff but it's I quite like it. I quite like it. I've been using it for a long time now and I quite like it. Is it finished Mm. yet? No. Yeah, maybe that's why. When you say documents, do you mean like open office and things like that? Yeah. Well, um, wasn't one of the ideas of it that it looks better on LCD screens? So maybe Uh. if it doesn't look as good on paper. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be a good reason not to use it for a document then, really, wouldn't it? Yeah. And I've heard a few people say it looks a bit Star Trek y. (laughs) <laughs> like from the next generation font. Oh yeah, okay. From the L, L cars or whatever it's called, the, mm. the the computer interface they use on. I was expecting it to appear on the boot screen and and the Does shutdown screen. It didn't on my laptop. Oh, uh, I still had the old just like a monospace. Yeah, like the development. I, I, I was worrying about space. wondering about that, but I was only running release candidates. Oh, yeah. hang on! But you were doing it in VirtualBox. Yes. Yeah, there's a known problem with that. Ah, Have you got okay. an NVIDIA driver? Pass. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. I think it's all Intel. Oh goodness! Oh, mm. interesting. Think, I'll double check, but I think it's all open sourcey stuff. I might be wrong. But is is a known bug for with NVIDIA? Is there? Uh, well, yeah. If you it, because the NVIDIA driver doesn't support um, kernel mode switching, oh, okay. so you can't have the pretty boot up screen you end up with a horrible ascii it looked yeah horrible that looks like i probably have got nvidia then yeah <laughs> it sounds like i have bless I i'm running virtual box and i don't know about it so does it start up any quicker uh i don't know i say that like it's not fast anyway which it is yeah it's pretty quick but well no actually my desktop does start up pretty quick i've got a clean install of maverick on on my desktop and okay that's a fairly pokey machine but I can hit the power button, turn away, and not do much and look back, and it's at the logon screen. Yeah, and it's there with the drums. Apparently, there's proxy support for Ubuntu One File and notes synchronization, but not contacts or bookmarks or other CouchDB stuff. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame it's not all, that's not all working. There's been a few complaints about that. Does that include the music store in the file synchronization thing? Because um, that goes into your files, doesn't it? Yeah. So the file sync stuff works, but I think there's still problems with some parts of. Right. The Ubuntu One stuff. I I'm not sure which bits. I'm still, I'm still using Ubuntu One, and, and I used it on my Maverick. You sound surprised. <laughs> well, it's only because everybody else goes on about it. But I tried it on Maverick today. Um, I hadn't enabled it on that machine before. And, yeah, it kicked into life and um, brought down the files. I might give so it a go it. again with Maverick, because I tried it and then switched to using Dropbox, because I just found it wasn't... It, it just at one, one time just decided to stop recognising the fact that I was connecting to it at all right but that's it not that. ideal it does that yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm quite liking the ubuntu one music store though i'm trying to get as much 
not that I buy a huge amount of music, but when I want to, have I you actually bought stuff from it? Yeah. Well, cool. yeah. It's not important what. Don't don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah Montana. No, not Hannah Montana. It, it Cheryl really, Cole. It, no, it really doesn't matter. I don't mind saying I bought Cheryl Cole from the music store. The the actual person. <laughs> <laughs> She's only small. Yeah. <laughs> How many kilobytes? Um, but yeah, so um, that's fine. And um, there's a few bits missing as well. That are, we already talked about F-Spot has gone um, from the default install, but also the software sources menu items disappear. Yeah, it's just hidden because now you get – it's just one less um, thing to get to on the menu. So you get to it through Update Manager, there's a button, or through the new software center. You can so get it's to it through there. moved rather than gone. Yeah, I, I think it will throw a few people that are used to it. Because they'll wonder, you know, where it went. Because they used to go in there maybe to add repositories or something like that. But, yeah, and um, PPAs and stuff, I guess. Yeah. But again, if you're adding PPAs, you can probably click through the menu and not worry about mm-hmm. it too much. Cool. And um, there's some sort of automatic desktop background rendering thing. Yeah, I saw a discussion about this. Mar- um, Mark Shuttleworth and Martin Owens were having a discussion on one of the artwork mailing lists about how there was this theory that, you know, the, the previous work, um, wallpaper that you mentioned, the blobs... Yeah. Well, the theory was that that would be kind of dynamic. And so you'd get a different type Moving of wallpaper. Blocks. Yeah, it'd be SVG. And it'd be dynamic based on, I don't know, where you are, time of day, you know, stellar constellations or whatever. Right. Um, but that kind of hadn't Sun happened yet. Wasn't, wasn't ready yet. Right. You know? So dynamic, endlessly scalable blobs. Yeah. Cool. Moving blobs as well. Yeah. Ones that base on Brownian motion. Oh, uh, no, no, we don't do brown. Aubergine <laughs> 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 Like Aubergine in motion. <laughs> oh, yes, that is a very Aubergine sweaty yeah, thing. It is. Yeah. yeah. He's very corporate. So, uh, while Mark's here, we should learn about what's new in KDE because I have no idea. Yeah, what's up? Uh, right, Kubuntu, as I say, I, I only tried the release candidate because um, I tried it on Saturday. So, uh, mm-hmm. it, there might be a few things about this which aren't true in the final, final release. But um, the big thing is they've upgraded to KDE 4.5. Okay. which is the latest release. Um, so a few things that came in just from that are things like the system tray icons are now monochrome, which is... I a, think you mean notification area. No, I don't, because on KDE, the plasmoid is definitely called system tray. Oh, my uh, gosh. How oh, passe. Dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they've, they've switched to the kind of mono theme yeah, icons. Yeah, it's sort of like um, sort of white with a greyish outline. Right, okay. Um, hmm. Looks quite nice, but um, sort of a bit unexpected because everything perhaps? was sort of yeah. Because KDE always strikes me yeah, as exactly. a colourful, bright. All the, all the shiny, icons were sort of more yeah. sort of high res. Before. Poke your eyes out, yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the other notable thing, uh, well, particularly notable thing, is that they've replaced Conqueror, which was the um, web browser that's oh. the default KDE uh, sort of flagship web browser. Uh, with a project called Reconk, which is more like a stripped down Firefoxy type web browser, because Conqueror was more it was sort of file manager. Well, it was file well, manager. It? it basically everything viewer. Right. If you wanted to view a file of any sort, whether it was on the network or on your computer, you could do it in Conqueror. Um, but then they switched out to using Dolphin when KDE four started, which is just dedicated to just files. Wasn't Conqueror one of the big selling points of KDE that it was like, you know, this one simplified user interface that, you know, gets you to everything you ever need yeah, to Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I like so much about it. Um, but then I Dolphin does all of those things and I use Firefox for um, right. for web browsing anyway. But yeah, the notable thing with Reconk is that they've also got rid of what they had before was uh, an installer. They didn't have Firefox installed by default, but they had a Firefox installer installed by default. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just like a one-click install and it was there. Right. But now they've got rid of that as well in favour of Reconk. Um, apparently, it's still there, according to the Kubuntu website, but that might just mean it's in the repositories right? if you want it. And is Reconk still uh, WebKit-based like yes. Conqueror? Yes, yeah. Okay. In fact, it's now it's entirely WebKit-based, whereas I think Conqueror is still, is still sort of optional KHTML or right. WebKit, depending on uh, your preference. Um, and from what I could see, they still don't have Ubuntu 1 set up by default, and there's still no... Um, Ubuntu One Music Store in Amarok, which is a shame. Oh, even that's though it's because it's, it's linked into other web-based services like um, uh, Manga Tune and those other sort of things. Manga Tune, whatever it's called, Gemendo, yeah. yeah. But um, Ubuntu One Music Store doesn't appear to be there yet. Again, that might have been a release candidate thing that mm. they hadn't finished it or whatever. But it just seems a bit of a shame that it's missing out on it. Is there yeah, a, six months later? Yeah. Is there an optional extension for it? Though? Um, none that I could find. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a bit weird. Amarok sort of. Um, moved on quite a bit and it seems to have stripped down 
um, because it's, it's a separate project from KDE altogether. So they oh, just right. pull it into Kubuntu. Um, the, but they've sort of stripped down the uh, sort of optional features. There's no install plugins section in the menus anymore or anything like that, like there used to be. Um, so it might just be that you have to go into the software center and find it in there. Mm. But I certainly couldn't find it with a sort of cursory glance over the interface, which you'd expect to if it was, yeah, you know, pushing that. Yeah, so, no, that's fair enough. So is Amarok the default like rhythm boxes for yes, Ubuntu? Yeah. And can you install Rhythmbox? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can install on Kubuntu. It's basically just, instead of the Ubuntu desktop package, you've got the Kubuntu desktop package. Mm. So you can have both side by side and XFCE as well if you want, or neither, and just run a server. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in the same way that most Nomi people probably wouldn't want KDE apps, yeah. Yeah, KDE exactly. people probably don't want Nomi apps. Yeah, they, they don't tend to look very nice. Although you can get, it does come also on Kubuntu, um, there's a sort of default um, interface for applying your... KDE theme to no maps, which oh, right. works oh. quite well. It works with Firefox oh, quite that's well. Good. Um, but yeah, um, in general, they don't tend to work as nicely. <laughs> and no font um, yet, apparently. In, in KDE, um, in Kubuntu. No new font, yeah. yeah. Apparently, the, the KDE community are evaluating it. Evaluating it. Okay, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some comments from the community yes. as well. Indeed. Um, and Dennis Lahane says that a Maverick Meerkat works straight out of the box and Ubuntu have released a ton of excellence. And we note that he sent this using Thunderbird. Yeah. That, I thought that was interesting. You know the whole brouhaha about evolution adding sent yeah. from Ubuntu at the bottom? Well, when we got this mail from uh, from Dennis, it had at the bottom a, an actual image of the Thunderbird logo and it was kind of sent from Thunderbird. Hmm. I I don't know. He must have turned that on by default. He must have turned that on. That wouldn't be dead by default. An actual it? graphic. Yeah, yeah, logo. Like your company like logo. An HTML you know, email. Yeah. Signature, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying anything bad about Dennis. I'm just saying, no, you no, know, no, it was, it was just interesting. interesting. I've not seen it before, so I mean, no, it's me neither. noteworthy. Mm. Next up. Matt Grove said, I like the new installer where it lets you do the questions while it's already installing. And he also commented that at least they haven't moved the buttons, buttons back. again. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, he's put it in a slightly earthier way. Yes. And um, uh, Tom Bragg says, I like the integration of items in the what's it area at the top. I assume he's talking about the uh, notification, notification area. area. Yeah, that's I'll, I'll stick yes. with the name terminology. I'm going to stick with what's it area. <laughs> <laughs> so if you click on the speaker icon, you get the volume control and music player status. The new netbook style desktop is okay, works well enough, but feels a little sluggish in, in, uh, sluggish in comparison to the old one although it's not obvious how to open a second window of something like a second terminal window, for example. Yeah, because everything's full screen. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, you know, when you open a terminal, oh, okay. it goes, brrrr, yeah. goes full screen. That, that brrrr was the yeah. sound of something going full screen. <laughs> now he's gesticulating and yeah, demonstrating with my things fingers. on the radio. Yeah. Well, I mean, but uh, Netbook Edition's done that before. Yeah. Is it yeah, any yeah. different from that? Maybe he's just still Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I sort of know what he, what he means is, that, um, normally I use Terminator on my computers, uh, the terminal multiplex, I think. Mm -hmm. But on my netbook where I have Easy Peasy, which is Netbook Edition, I use just the plain GNOME terminal because you can do tabs and you can't really do split screens and things on a tiny mm. netbook screen anyway. Mm. So I give that one a go, Tom. And Alan Lord says, 1010 Maverick, you've got to love it. <laughs> Thanks, I think Alan. he likes it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yes. yes. Well, don't bowl us over with the detail on that one, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a tweet, you know. Yeah. Okay. Couldn't fit much in. 140 characters. Well, um, if you've given Maverick a go, hot off the press, um, why not send us an email or a tweet or whatever and let us know what you think of it, what you like, and perhaps where uh, you might want to see a bit more polish. So send us an email to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. It's time for the news. Fresh from divorcing its new overlords at Oracle, the OpenOffice.org community has set up the Document Foundation to safeguard the project. They've temporarily rebranded the Office Suite as LibreOffice, but hope to acquire the OpenOffice.org name from Oracle. I'm not sure how much of a chance they stand of yes. getting that, to be honest. Mm. Mm. Well, didn't Oracle, Oracle had a response just recently, actually? What day is it? Yeah, oh, right, okay. a few days ago, and they said, well, one of the news articles has reported that Oracle has all but confirmed that it will be not be joining the list of contributors to the mm. new open office offshoot Li LibreOffice. I can't think of LibreOffice without thinking of Nacho Libre. <laughs> <laughs> LibreOffice! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, open, uh, do you see Oracle keeping OpenOffice going? 
Do you think um, they care about Open Office? I don't think no. they do. Not really? Exactly, no. I think they they brought Sun for MySQL and ended up yeah. with all these other stuff that they don't really know what to do with. Well, and a bunch of patterns, probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Java. And Java. I think those are the two bits they really worry about. Oh well. The British government has released a Creative Commons compatible license, which allows the modification, sharing, and commercial exploitation of content released under it. Although use of the license is strongly encouraged, it's not, however, compulsory. Yes, it's good to see some sort of openness. So is this for data that the government have and they release? Yes. So open data.gov. Oh, yeah. Something. Oh, yeah. That one. Tim Berners Lee's thing. That's yes. what I think of it as. So I, I think they can choose to release under their license. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not aware of anybody who has actually done anything yet. But There's a couple of exemptions. Or, um, sorry, additional license criteria. Mm. It says um, you've got to ensure that you don't use the information in a way yeah. that suggests any official status or the information provider endorses you or your information. Okay, fair enough. But. Um, the, the second one says, ensure that you do not mislead others or misrepresent the information or its source. Surely that's open to interpretation. Misleading is, I suppose, but you, yeah, easy to decide to source. Mm. Okay, well, we'll have to see what um, what comes out of that, what extra... Mm. Yeah, and the important thing is you can remi- remix it, reuse it, redistribute it, and um, um, make pro- a profit from it. You can use yeah. it for commercial activities as well. Oh, oh that's good. Cool. So hopefully open source community projects that, mm. you know, rely on you know, like, stuff like postcode data or yeah. whatever. The European Commission is suing UK government for not protecting the privacy of consumers properly following the use of snooping advertising software Form by BT. Consumers who complained after they were put in a trial without being informed by the ISP were told that the Information Commissioner did not have the appropriate powers to investigate. Mm. Now Form is this thing where it watches your what you're looking at online mm. and then sort of like Google AdWords but yeah. more global will put in targeted advertising into pages which subscribe but it, to it but it absolutely like doesn't know who you are we promise really it doesn't know who you are yeah. just what you're doing uh, yeah <laughs> just every single website you go to and, and it's, it's only their ISP customers mm-hmm. yeah because the it, box is, host, uh, is housed inside the ISP uh, so and, it goes through them yeah so your traffic goes through them and you you opt out you have to opt out it's not a thing that, and yeah. it was only a trial blah 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 blah. but the interesting thing about this is that the, the eu is saying that the british government has got a duty to actually regulate this sort of activity and they're not doing it at the moment and they're hence the, hence the lawsuit mm-hmm. well i mean saying that they can't regulate a private company using people's data sounds a bit odd mm. yeah so i'm not surprised especially when they can do it, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah especially no. when you can do it if it's a public body so why not a private body yeah hmm. Microsoft has sued Motorola for patent violation in their Android handsets. It's not clear from the suit whether the allegedly infringing patents are in Motorola's modifications or in the Android codebase. Is there anyone left not being sued in the mobile phone space? I'm not. (laughs) Not yet. You barely have a mobile phone. (laughs) (laughs) I have a mobile phone. Yeah. And after years of development, it seems, the new version of Gallery has been released. Having learnt their lessons from the unpopular 2.0 version, the new release promises to be small, intuitive, fast and customisable. Are they going to break everyone's URLs again? <laughs> Probably. Well, where it says, at the moment it says V2 in the URL, so presumably that's going to break. It's going to go to V3 at the very least. That, that was the day that I, I, I got really annoyed with Gallery is when I upgraded from 1 to 2. And all the URLs broken. I'm sure there's a way to fix it all, but mm. it's just out the box to press a button and upgrade, and then find that links to all your images that you've used in your blog post, for example, yeah. were all broken. Yeah, not good. But the new version seems to have um, taken a taken a big usability uh, go. You've talked about it, um, yeah. Before, you know and what? I blogged about the first release candidate, I think. Um, so I've not looked at it since then. But they, uh, I think they've got somebody from. I think it was Open Usability. Org. Um, they had a look at it and they spent a lot of time analysing the user base and talking to people. They did a massive um, survey, I think, and they stripped it all back so that rather than supporting every database under the sun and every operating system, and they picked the one that they wanted to target. So then they focused Windows on and that. SQL Server. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> Linux and MySQL. I think it's Linux, MySQL, PHP, probably Windows as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, so they're not supporting like Oracle and <laughs> DB2 and everything that they yeah, could be possibly. Choice. <laughs> choice is overrated. Um, well, it's an internal component, isn't it? Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, so the and it all looks really nice, and you can click on buttons and things instead of having to Sounds find magic. obscure <laughs> drop down lists everywhere. And yeah, I did so I had feed, did do some feedback, and they changed something. Are you gonna, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Are you going to upgrade yours? Because you use Gallery a lot, don't you? Um, not so much since version two. <laughs> no, we stopped at <laughs> version two. That. I've got a few extra galleries and things I've put up there. But yeah, I'll, I'll I'd really again. like to um, just wait for Dreamhouse to support it. Oh, is that where your gallery is? I thought yes. it was hosted in your lounge. No, nope. or somewhere. No, <laughs> no. Is it under uh, the oh, it used to be a home hosted thing, but right. um, now it's not. Okay, Scott Charney from Microsoft's trusted computing team. Hi. Have suggested that <laughs> infected or compromised computers should be kicked off the internet. His proposal, presented at a recent security conference, would essentially make ISPs implement a network access control system to prevent compromised computers from connecting. Yeah, so if you haven't got an up to date virus checker and you haven't had a scan in the last mm. 24 hours and you haven't installed your Windows updates or whatever, then you won't be able to get on the network. Interestingly enough, one of my friends who's housemates apparently had a virus got kicked off by his isp until they fixed it right and well, they had to they had to basically get it confirmed by a computer expert that they didn't have any viruses on their machine <laughs> at which point i installed ubuntu on his laptop right <laughs> nice, move. nice uh, move were you the computer expert as well um <laughs> i have apparently confirmed. apparently they already had a they had a letter from a computer expert but he just wanted me to check it over just in case it was his fault which letter was it <laughs> was it a k oh they haven't done that one yet <laughs> Sounds a bit like your MOT, you know, just because it's, it's clean on the day you get yeah, your certificate doesn't exactly. mean you're not dodgy the next day. Mm. But yeah, I mean, ISPs have been kicking people off for infringing traffic for, you know, for a while, but this is actually more proactive. This is the next st- stage of it, I guess. You know, you have to be in a clean condition in order to connect in the first place. But he says something like, um, we should be learning from public health and how, um, you know, if somebody's really not very well and they shouldn't be out in society, we lock them up in <laughs> quarantine. It's like, I don't believe that happens very much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we have to learn from the Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it doesn't happen very much. Do we still give people lobotomies? <laughs> Google have responded to the lawsuit from Oracle, which cra- claims they have infringed Java patents in Android and claim they haven't. They even claim that Oracle might not exist. <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. This is one of the... Uh, they, they, they've responded to all Oracle's points. Yeah, so they uh, really went to town they, on it as yeah, well. Yeah, apparently it's a bit of a hatchet job. I mean, I'm not a legal expert. You may be shocked to know. Um, <laughs> But they they refute all the all the claims one by one, and Oracle's first claim is that they are from such and such an address, and they are they t- t- trade in this state. And um, the replies are like, Google has not got any evidence that this statement is true. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah. So yeah, another uh, another salvo in the patent wars. Yes. That's all the news. It's time for the events. The UK Unix User Group Floss Unconference is this weekend on the sixteenth of October. Where? In Birmingham. Birmingham. <laughs> There's like a vague feeling of Birmingham in the room. <laughs> a vague feeling of Birmingham. Yeah, I think it's in Birmingham. Check it out. It is. Birmingham and Midlands Institute. There we go. Barcamp Southampton, hosted by SoTech, uh, is happening on the November the 27th uh, in, Beavers, Southampton? in Southampton, Beavis Valley. There's two pubs it's happening at now. The Shooting Star, which is sort of in the middle of the valley, and there's... Uh, the Hobbit, which is up the top, and they've got the bottom bar in there as well, because due to increased interest, they had to uh, get a second venue. Whoa. So you have to pick yeah. a venue. Well, no, apparently, well, because there's only three minutes walk between ah. the two, so they're opening the Hobbit um, bit uh, sort of about midday, I think, because that's when they're expecting people to really arrive in anger mm. <laughs> in <laughs> when anger. the pubs are open. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I must learn about cool. open source technology. Wow, well, it's not it's not specifically no, uh, no, focused at open source. That's in fact, true. it's just sort of general. I think they they informally refer to themselves as the anti luddite league. It's great to see such popularity for this sort of mm. event in, yeah. in, in Southampton, obviously, which is near where we which live. Which is just around the corner. And there's lots of very familiar names there as are, I go there? down the list. Yes, it's basically all of Hampshire Lug. Ah, okay. <laughs> Hampshire Lug, a few IBMers. <laughs> oh dear. Hampshire Lug and IBM. Well, there we go. That's lots of Alan's. And it's free. Yes, it is free. So make sure you turn up if you've got a ticket. We have tickets. Yes, we're going and we're going to turn up. Yeah, so yes. have I. Cool. Yes, me too. Excellent. Why not come along and say hello? <laughs> Tony will be doing his talk about podcasting Probably, yeah. again. <laughs> well, I might volunteer it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get another Don't, Did you get the email saying, thank you for volunteering? What's that? You didn't volunteer. Everyone's a volunteer. Oh, uh, there. <laughs> yes, I got that email. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, no, I didn't get that email. <laughs> you can get mum bun two out again. 
could squeeze another few iterations out of these things. I can't remember what I was going to do. Just tap dance. Okay. We're going to play next an interview with Tim Dobson that I did at the OpenTech event about four weeks ago. And Tim talks a little bit about his uh, young rewired state that he's involved in. Um, in fact, one of the uh, the projects that we talk a little bit about, I think, in the interview, um, has got a bit of press recently, um, which is for, which is a project by Isabel Long. Yeah, she's a Ubuntu member, community contributor, yeah. and um, yes, keen programmer so, and developer and all that kind of stuff. So, what's this project got uh, press about? <laughs> I don't know. You interviewed Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that, but the press has happened since <laughs> since I did the interview, so we don't talk about it very much. Um, it was about her um, project to analyse the power usage between government departments and pit them against each other to try and drive down the cost of uh, energy use within government. And she came up with this at the event that she was there, and she got it's now been adopted by the cabinet office and, mm. and hosted for her, and they're, they're looking after it. And David Cameron said it's a brilliant thing, apparently. Yeah. So that's really good. So uh, yeah. that's uh, the, some of the context of the sort of events that they do at Young Rewired State. Yeah. So let's have a listen to the interview. I'm here with Tim Dobson, a good friend of the Ubuntu UK podcast here at OpenTech, and he's been talking about, well, why don't you tell us what you've been talking about today? So I've been talking about um, Young Rewired State Manchester. Um, Young Rewired State is a, uh, an event across the UK where young people get together with um, kind of open data hackers and build applications with government-released open data. Okay, that sounds really sort of straightforward, but I, I bet it's not. Uh, what sort of data and what sort of hacking and all sorts? Well, you're, you're right, it's certainly not uh, trivial. Um, Basically, it's very much an, an rewired state, the organization that run it, run the whole kind of the, the uh, nationwide event, give very much kind of open book to, to young developers. So I, I went to, let me, let me tell you a bit of a story about how this whole thing got started. Last year, Young Rewired State, which is an organization that runs hack days about government open data, ran their first Young Rewired State event. Um, it was a great event. It was um, two days at Google HQ in London, and they paid sponsorship using sponsorship money. They paid for the expenses and accommodation um, of people from around the UK, young people around the UK, to travel to to the event. It was fantastic. Over two days, couldn't have asked for any better. But it was a bit short at two days, and it was quite central centralised on London. So when it came round to doing it again this year. Um, they were keen to decentralise it around the UK because sponsorship money has become a lot more difficult to find in recent recent days. Um, but also to kind of decentralise it and move it away from just London being the, the core hub. So having enjoyed it so much at um, last year, I thought, well, why don't I run a hub, uh, run a run an event, a local event up in Manchester, um, so we can kind of. Show, show the whole of the UK what Manchester has to offer on kind of an, a national scale. Um, so we put together um, an event and tried to gather together various different strands of the community and, uh, and the event happened at the start of August. Okay, so how did the event go? How many people turned up and what did you get up to? I, I think the, the event was definitely a success. Um, we got we got um, to be honest, we left it a little bit to the last minute, so we only got 10 people, which we'd kind of been hoping for a little bit more. Um, but the event was definitely went really a lot better than I'd expected, to be honest. Um, we got together in Mad Lab, which is a, a hack space in Manchester, um, who kindly kind of un- offered their space, and an open data um, cooperative in Manchester, uh, Substance.coop, kindly kind of sponsored food and kind of people time from various kind of um, open data hackers um, during that during that time frame. We kind of wanted to make um, the one in Manchester special um, because we want we want, really want to highlight kind of what Manchester is all about and the, the big open data scene that's going on in Manchester. So we invited open. D- Paul Robinson from Open Data Manchester, which is a, a local user group who are campaigning for the release of open data and local government up in Manchester, um, to come down and talk about some of the successes and difficulties that he's been having getting local councils and um, local government bodies to release um, open data. And so one of the cool things that he, he mentioned was the 
GMPTE, the, the Manchester uh, Transport Executive, have recently released um, a load of timetable information about, um, about all the bus timetables in Manchester. So that's currently now fairly open data. Um, has been released um, to the world. And so this was kind of this. And we, we also tried to kind of broaden our, the, uh, the young people's horizons a bit. So we took them on a tour of Melbourne IT's data centre um, just to show that kind of computers isn't all about sitting in the kind of a basement hack space and talking about eating pizza, which was obviously great fun. So why is it important to get young people involved in this for you? Because, I mean, generally IT is fairly age agnostic. If you've got the skills and the interests, you can get involved. So there's a lot of young people out there who are really kind of very skilled. Um, but they're not necessarily connected with the rest of the community and they're not necessarily aware of what standard ways of working are. So when you get young people going through, um, going through school and going through, um, going through their university degrees and whatnot, they quite often are aware of that there's an IT industry out there but take all their kind of first, take all the um, knowledge of IT from their education now, that's not necessarily a great idea um, when, it, when it comes to it because you generally find that, well, employers basically scream and howl when they get uh, university students coming through because they don't really know their stuff based on the courses. There's also another kind of perspective on it, um, which is more the rewired state perspective in that the older people have different kind of perspectives on what's useful for the data. So one of the cool um, applications that one of the guys came up with um, during Young Rewired State Manchester was really quite specific to being a young person. So a lot of, um, when you go to school, you have to put up with content filtering systems in schools. Now, if you are doing, doing schoolwork, sometimes these, these can get in the way. So you might find that the blog which probably has information from a, a history professor or a geography, um, geography lecturer at some university is blocked because for some reason the whole of Blogspot is blocked. Um, but there's very little information about kind of how this affects people and whatnot. So one of the guys built a little application that basically uses Ajax to check whether um, each of the sites, each of a list of predefined sites is available. Um, and then kind of reports it back to a, a central server. So we can kind of come up with some, get some real statistics going of um, what sites uh, young people around the UK can actually visit and whether it's kind of impeding their, impeding their educational learning. It's more to kind of promote discussion rather than kind of make any specific agenda. Um, but we feel that it could be quite an interesting thing. When we, uh, well... Obviously, the, the whole hack week was during the summer holidays, but um, we, put, we put out the prototype to uh, public sector and big corporates people out on Twitter and said, please, will you come and test this for us on your internal network and see, see what happens? Um, and did they? They did, uh, in quite large numbers, and we had some very interesting results. Um, so, oh, please don't properly quote me off the top of my head. Um, but I believe the Department of Culture, Media and Sports can access WikiLeaks, but can't access Wikipedia or something. Nice, that makes sense. Yes, it makes, well, it's good for us, but probably not for them. Um, and that's a very different set of filtering restrictions than you might expect in an educational environment as well, where there are different concerns. Absolutely, and we were just kind of really just going out there to test, the, test whether the code works, but it turns out that it actually probably could have quite interesting uses um, across the corporate and public sector as well. So that was just one project that came out of that week. Were there any other interesting projects you can think of? There, there were quite a few interesting projects and quite a few... Um, well, we, we kind of went through the, the whole week with... Um, the idea was to make it useful and beneficial, but also not be incredibly dull. So there's quite a lot of rather fun prototypes that we built. So... Not that these are the most useful ones, like you asked, um, but some of the guys came up with um, some HTML5 demos that um, kind of, you had a spinning wheel, like Wheel of Fortune, of, um, of the spending by government departments, and then when it stopped, you kind of get 
a, uh, a Dalek like exterminate and that segment disappears. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, but some of the more useful ones, um, well, one guy kind of reimagined um, up my street um, in a kind of different kind of way. Um, Which is the repairs thing, isn't it? If you've got a fault with a street lamp or a pothole, is that right? No. Um, up my street is a site where... Well, let me describe the site in that, that, that one of the young guys built. So basically, when you're moving to a new area, um, you want to know a little bit about the area and what the kind of background of the whole area you're moving to is, rather than just kind of accidentally moving to an area that's got really high crime rates. So you kind of pulled in crime rates and education stats... And so you could select various properties and see what kind of the risks and uh, benefits of moving to that area were. Um, and considering this is probably from someone who's not even completed their A-levels yet and probably wouldn't have built this otherwise, I, th- I find this kind of thing stunning. OK, so are you planning on doing another one? Oh, definitely. I mean, one of the other applications that, that got built, um, it was, it was a, as I said uh, mentioned earlier, the... Manchester Transport Executive released a load of bus timetables. So two of the guys, just kind of for a bit of fun, put together a, a kind of timetable application that basically, when you typed the app, the bus number in, showed you a load of the showed you the bus route, and then you could click on a bus stop and view the times. This is actually really useful because they turned it into a mobile application, and suddenly GMPTE, the Manchester Transport Executive, was calling them in for kind of press interviews and getting. Manchester Evening News involved so um, I, th- I think we're definitely going to do another one um, it's probably going to be next year um, but I, th- I think more great things are on the horizon um, that that may or may not be done kind of under the rewired state banner OK this is all quite a long way from um, one of the things that you were involved in before which is when you very generously sponsored the first Old Camp event with, with Pokebook um, this is all very serious and grown up well one would like to think that um, you, there's, 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 there's also a st- oh I'm going to have to go into this now um, so we were in the pub after one day I was, me and some of the mentors were in the pub after Yingli Wide State one of the days and we were thinking that it was actually kind of a bit um, well how could we interpret the data in new and interesting ways so some people suggested interpretive dance um, but none of us can really dance um, so what we thought was that we should kind of bring open data back to kind of the young people and we should write a, open, uh, a young rewired state rap um, now I'm not, I'm not very good at writing raps um, thankfully um, so I, just was, I was just chatting to someone at a technical meet saying yeah, well, we're trying to write this rap um, and they said oh I'll go away and do it so at 2am the next morning uh, they, they, they emailed me the lyrics I recorded them in two goes and there's, a, there's now a kind of lip synced video as well well, I, I'm glad to see you've not totally lost your, uh, your, your talent for the, uh, the slightly more trivial side of life. Um, so where can people find out more? Sure. So if you want to look at any of the, um, locate the demos that we built up in Manchester, you can go to dev.dfey.org. Um, also, you should check out um, rewiredstate.org. There's a list of kind of all the projects that all the centres around um, Britain, those kind of those centres in Norwich, Edinburgh, Man- uh, London, Brighton um, and all the applications everybody in the whole kind of national event are listed on the Rewired States site in London. I'm at tdobson.net um, and I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. No problem at all. And now we've got some command line love. You've got to say it's sexier. <laughs> yeah. And now... This isn't just any command line love. <laughs> this is Alan Pope's command line love. That's too sexy. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> That's not sexy enough. Oh, okay. Right. What, what have you got, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> Let's suppose that you get your email and it's on uh, some hosted server somewhere and you want to back it up. Like Gmail? Like Gmail, like um, well, any kind of email that's accessible via IMAP. Okay the Web. common protocol thing. Um, there's a program called Offline IMAP, which mm. you can run. It's in the Ubuntu repository. And uh, you configure it with a little config file. Okay. And then you just run Offline IMAP. And it will go off and get your mail from the server and bring it down and store it wherever you tell it to on your local machine or on a server somewhere else. So how do you then access that mail store? Well, you don't have to access it. I mean, it could just be a backup. 
right, um, okay. or you could use it as a way to get mail from one service to another. So, for example, if you're migrating away from Gmail and you want to have your own hosted server, okay. it's a way to get your mail out of Gmail and onto mm-hmm. your own box. Um, but uh, but you can access it uh, once you've once you've pulled the mail out uh, using any traditional mail client. So you know, you could point okay. your Thunderbird at it. You could point your um, Mutt or whatever mail client you use at that that directory full of mail, and it should uh, be able to read that as if it was just like a folder full of mail. Do you have to be running your own IMAP server to do that? No. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> presumably you could. You could. Um, the The point about offline IMAP is it's it's just the syncing thing. Right. It doesn't. It's not an IMAP server. It's mm. just. It's actually an IMAP client, funnily enough. Yeah. Because it connects to the IMAP server and pulls all your mail down. But the really cool thing, and the thing you have to be quite careful of, is it's bi-directional. So if you did pull all your mail down with offline IMAP, and then you point your mail client at that local store, mm. and then you think, nah, I don't really want this. And then in your mail client, you hit the delete button. Next time you run offline IMAP, oh. it will send that delete request off to the mail server and delete all your mail. Right. Have so you done that? Once you know that. No, I haven't. <laughs> okay. Because I read the manual. Um, but once you know that, you know, it's, it's, um, I think it's actually configurable. You might be able to turn that off. But it's a really cool way to synchronize multiple accounts, lots of folders from one place to another. Cool. It's time for the bit about Ubuntu. And what's in the bit this time? <laughs> Laura? Ops for you, who do network monitoring on yep. Linux, have teamed up with Canonical <gasps> to try and push the enterprise adoption of Ops view on the uh, Ubuntu server. Groovy. Yeah. That's yeah. Nag- Nagios based, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it's the front sort of glamorous front end to Nagios. So I think it's, this means you're going to be able to get it through the partner repository, get oh. you through the partner oh. repository. Now, I presume this is the enterprise edition. You can already get the community, community edition of Opsview on Ubuntu just from their public repository. So I guess this is all the added goodness. You've used it, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And they sponsored OddCamp as well. Oh, they did, yes. So. Um, oh, yeah, we remember that. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, I, I've used it in two different places that I worked, and it's it's great. I really like it. So, yeah, and good to see kind of more networking tools mm. getting adoption on Ubuntu. The Journal of Strategic Management Education has published a white paper called The Role of Serial, o- Serial Entrepreneurs in the Internationalization of Global Startups, a Business Case, which focuses on Mark Shuttleworth and Canonical. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Um, I can't read the paper because it's forty pounds, and I haven't bought it. It's not open source. That that's how they make their money. That's so typical of canonical. <laughs> that's how these entrepreneurs make all their cash. You've got to spend forty pound to read. Well, this is this is the journal it. that's selling the article, not canonical. I should point out. Okay, fair <laughs> fair point. I was going to say yes. I remember buying Mark a pint in the pub, but I don't remember getting one back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but, how they make their money. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but it's an interesting idea. The fact that. Um, it says serial entrepreneurs, so you know, using using the idea of of sort of angel investors or whatever in, in different companies coming and starting all these these things up and and setting them going, and people who do it more than once, how can they be consistently successful? Is it just potluck, or have they actually got some interesting skills or techniques? Yeah. Who knows? With enough money, any of us could be an entrepreneur if we read this paper. If only we had the money to buy the paper, <laughs> <laughs> we'd yeah. be able to have money have to buy around. papers. <laughs> <laughs> A new cloud platform has arrived in Ubuntu called OpenStack, which is an alternative to the current um, choice, which is Eucalyptus. Mm. Um, so this is uh, led by Rackspace, I think, OpenStack. And NASA. And NASA. Oh, mm. right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And actually, there's just a, a blog post just today from uh, Soren, Hans- uh, Soren Hansen, um, who, <laughs> according to his blog, is not the golfer, Soren <laughs> Hansen, but the well-known sysadmin who used to work for Canonical now works for Rackspace. Uh-huh. And he's posted a, a great big blog post about how uh, parts of OpenStack are now available in Ubuntu Maverick. Oh, right. Okay. And so I thought it was I thought it was going to be held back for 11.04. Yeah, this isn't a release. It's, um, oh, okay. as he details in his blog post, it's a snapshot, but it, he said it's in pretty good shape um, for people oh, to cool. try it out. So this is basically a system for creating a cloud yes. with Ubuntu. Yes. Based on the new um, uh, OpenStack Made, as I said, by um, Rackspace and uh, NASA and community as well. And AMD and Dell and Intel as well. So it's got oh, some, some good backing, yeah. according to this report here. Yeah, you can kind of see why they've kind of 
but embrace this as well as, or maybe instead of Eucalyptus. Now, Eucalyptus is based on Amazon, of course, which mm. at the moment is the dominant player in cloud. But yeah, so maybe it's swinging the other way. Interesting mm. one to watch that one. At a recent Lucid release party, not so recent, um, Dustin Kirkland bought a round of beer and commented that he, for the same price he could have bought everyone in the pub an hour free on the Ubuntu uh, server runtime in the cloud. Mm. So somebody thought this was a good idea. One of which seems to be our own Dave Walker. Yes. <laughs> he thinks anything involving beer is a good idea. <laughs> but this doesn't involve beer. And flops. <laughs> so this Sunday, to celebrate 10 10 10, um, the uh, Canonical are paying for everybody to have a free hour running their own Ubuntu server instance in the Amazon EC2 cloud. Yeah, and then cool. pick up the tab for an hour of computing. And you set up your SSH key pair and stuff. And can oh, it's all pretty much it. automatic, actually. It'll get your SSH. If you've already got a Launchpad account, okay. you give them your Launchpad account, it'll get your SSH key from there. Oh, right. And you're laughing. You can get straight in. Cool. That's good, because you don't want to spend your whole hour trying to get it working. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to sort out the Maybe we should have a competition so you could do the most in an hour. I was actually thinking that. We should Ooh. ask our listeners to do it. If you go to 10.cloud.ubuntu.com, you right. can sign up there. So it's the number 10.cloud.ubuntu.com. Okay. You can sign up for an hour. Hmm. So you've got nothing to lose. Sign up for an hour of uh, Amazon EC2. Um, tell us what you did with it, or if you're not, you know, don't want to try it out yet, what you would do with it. Okay. And um, what can they win? <laughs> Uh, an hour in the cloud. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, so if go, they use one hour productively, then we can make them have another hour. <laughs> no. <laughs> Somebody's going to put their hand in the pocket. As well, all of the make sort of 50p it costs for an hour. Yeah, which to be fair, Mark was one who said competition, I think. So I think technically... Yeah, I say competition? They can win Mark <laughs> for an hour. I, th- I, th- I thought I just said we should see. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe there isn't a competition. But that, yeah, let us know what you way. could do with your hour. It's quite a small amount of time to do anything hugely yeah. constructive with. So. I don't know. You could spend an hour doing something like... Um, you could sync your lear- offline IMAP store. Learning, <laughs> and learning a programming language, you know, for yeah. an hour. Get started with Python or something like that. Okay. Or some other, you know, server scripting something. I don't know. Okay, because you couldn't install Python on your desktop. Well, maybe some people have restricted desktops. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Get started but can still very SSH quickly into an EC2 something. machine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> maybe. This is all going horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a great idea. The Fridge uh, website, which was um, a popular news uh, gathering source, yeah. has uh, been rebranded, renamed, and it's now Ubuntu News. Ubuntu-news.org, I believe. Yes. Okay, so what was wrong with the old one? Uh, <laughs> well... It's tricky. It's arguable nobody ever went there. And some of the guys in the news team are trying to raise the profile of this uh, news site because it's it's mm. kind of semi-official. You know, it's run yeah. on, or well, the fridge always was traditionally run on canonical hardware. And, um, you know, people from within the project were posting news articles to it. But the idea behind the, the news site is that that same team are posting news, but also they've got a little box on the right-hand side. And if you've got any news... Um, you can uh, just yeah. post it straight in there, send it to the team, they'll edit it and, you know, check it and post it online. Make sure it's worthy. Yeah. Cool. Okay, you know, you were involved in that, I think, weren't you? I helped it? out a little bit. Yeah, I helped them get the WordPress install set up, although it was a bit of a catastrophe yesterday because uh, it was running on a community member's VPS, who shall remain nameless, and there was a bug on the uh, the VPS front end, and they deleted a, de- a development VPS, and it went and spidered around and deleted all their VPSs. Oops. Yeah. So that was a bit um, not good. Double double plus ungood. <laughs> so um, so they've moved it to another VPS somewhere else. Another and level. everything's all tickety boo. But they, the really good thing is the the team behind it, a bunch of community guys. They had backups. They had everything set up so that they could just register a new. Uh, VPS somewhere else and bring the whole thing back online and it was all back up in a couple of hours as long as it takes the DNS to propagate really good brilliant okay and we'll check it out it's got all the new theme and uh, mm. yeah if you've got any news send it to ubuntunews.org um, Ubuntu One's pricing structure has changed ooh how uh, the original Ubuntu One is now called Ubuntu One Basic which still gives you two gigabytes for free okay um, but you can now buy sort of upgrade packs in 20 gigabyte chunks mm. Ooh. i think because before you could buy you had the free one or you had 50 gigs which you paid for and that yeah. was it wasn't yeah. it yeah so you can now buy increments of 20 gigs yes three dollars a month or 30 dollars a year which, which makes it more competitive with other services like dropbox uh, right okay uh. so you could have is there any ceiling at all now just as much as you're prepared to pay for um looks like it 
because yeah i think dropbox has three levels doesn't it yeah it's got two gig 50 gig 100 gig um for right. dropbox but uh, but the, the thing about dropbox is it, is it has other features that ubuntu one doesn't have so that's where it, it kind like of like a windows client there's a windows client and a mac client there's also the referral scheme so right. you know oh, you yeah. can give someone a referral link to dropbox and you get um a bit of extra space up to eight gig or something it is, it is now 250 nice. gig chunks yeah, mm-hmm. 250 and the person gig. signing up gets it as well yeah Although not if you refer to someone else who's in your same workplace because they spot that you're both on the same IP and they refuse to give you the referral because it's uh, you could be on the same computer. Ah. I experienced this myself by referring, <laughs> referring the person sat next to me. So it's not perfect, Dropbox, but um, yeah, I think Ubuntu One's certainly become more competitive. And the fact that it's pre-installed by default is uh, certainly a winner. Mm, and there's the Ubuntu One Mobile Contact Sync as well. Um, which was available from the seventh of October mm. for three ninety nine uh, that's dollars. Sorry, three dollars ninety nine a month, or forty dollars. The best part of, uh, of yeah. the year. So, if you want to have your contacts synced with your desktop calendar, uh, desktop um, information manager, or whatever they call it, PIM, PIM Evolution, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. And it's time for some feedback. Lots of it. Yep. Richard Gunn asks us to... Please refrain from using the term geek. It's not big, it's not clever, and it definitely isn't cool. Ubuntu is a great OS, and if the ordinary people who currently use Windows think that Linux is only for geeks, then they're less likely to consider using it. Well... I I think he typed it in that tone. (laughs) (laughs) He is kind of right. I know a lot of geeks who use Windows. On the other hand, if you're listening to a podcast about an operating system... You're probably a bit of a geek. Geeks are cool. Mm. Bow ties are cool. Fezzes are cool. (laughs) Geeks are cool. These are things we know now. Someone actually emailed me a photo. Peter Nicolaitis from the Fresh Ubuntu podcast emailed me a picture of Martin Owens at a wedding on 101010 wearing a bow tie and holding a fob watch. Brilliant. Does that make them cool? Yeah. He is a geek. Yeah, exactly. And I think th- there's nothing wrong with the term geeks. Geeks are cool. Geeks are mainstream. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit worried. I'm worried that this was as a result of me in the last show referring to myself as a geek. You are a geek. You I are. am a geek. I have a t-shirt that says I'm a geek. No. And I make no apology for that, I'm afraid. You can't it. <laughs> I think I might get a t-shirt that says I am not a geek. Or one that says he is a geek. Yes. <laughs> with an arrow pointing to him. Or he is Spock. Something like that. You'd always have to sit in that seat. <laughs> Ha ha! My plan is complete. <laughs> what if we invited you, him. What if you had? What if you had the arrow on a on a on a pivot that Spinner. rotated? Yes. Now that wouldn't be at all geeky. Tony points at his stomach. Actually, not a rotating one. An LED display. Ooh. Okay. With an arrow on it. With a, an arrow that guy, kind of goes like a banner, like one of those moving signs. Zzz, 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 yeah. Makes that noise as well. He's yeah. moving his finger across his tummy. Yeah. And the other way as well. <laughs> and the other hand. <laughs> Yeah, I've got two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew the special one. All right, um, Alan Bell added the Holmwood School in London to our collection of institutions which have logos very similar to the Ubuntu one. And the fact this is very, very similar. Yeah, when you say similar... This is the same with it, different colours. It is the logo with someone who's got a little pipette and picked up their company colours <laughs> and dropped them on the three things. Although they haven't done the but rotating yes, the colours no. round, have they? No, they haven't got, they haven't, they've matched colour heads with bodies, haven't they? Mm. If you're listening to this and you want, you want a bit of a laugh, go to thsl.org.uk and you'll see the logo right at the top. Maybe they have uh, the Homewood School Ubuntu as their uh, in-house operating system and that's the logo. Maybe they should. Mm. <laughs> or maybe they did theirs first. Ah, mm. prior art. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Prior- and maybe there's an educational branding company out there who's <laughs> onto a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Regular listener Matthew Phillips wrote to tell us about his project. Gnack track. Gnack track. Is that gnack track or am I? Or is it I I'd go gnack track. Gnack track. It's an Ubuntu-based penetration testing distro based on 10.04 and includes the GNOME interface. It all started off when I needed a testing platform for my job. It made sense to build my own with the tools that I want. After the first release on my personal website, it soon became clear that it would need its own site. Fortunately, I've received loads of help from the community as maintaining a distro on my own was hard work. The website can be seen at www.gnacktrack.co.uk and that's gnack, G-N-A-C-K. When I needed a testing platform for my job, it made sense to build my own. I'm not sure I follow that logic. <laughs> it might have been fun and interesting and rewarding. So presumably he's named it Knacktrack after Backtrack. 
Uh, yeah, I guess so. Because Backtrack's based on KDE, so Ganactrack will be, the, as he says, based on GNOME. So same kind of oh, okay. thing, but with GNOME front-end. Okay, <clears throat> cool. Because from my... Interesting, because from my use of Backtrack in the past, it doesn't really use any KDE applications, just the desktop environment. Well, one thing I did find with uh, Backtrack was that actually that I quite like the, the KDE network thingy where you scan for wireless. Just the basic. Uh, the wireless app- yeah. finder application, yeah. It's oh, a yeah. similar one that's in um, on the ASUS a- a- EPC, the original um, Xandros thing. The, oh, right. Yeah. It's oh. The same kind. I always thought that was quite nice. You know. See, I'd only really use the command line tools for... Yeah, so I'm I not could, a geek. <laughs> see if I could. I, I, I never said I wasn't a geek. <laughs> Presumably, most of the most of the testing tools are command line anyway. Nmap and Nessus yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I, I know some of them have got GUIs on the front end, but mm. oh well, cool, interesting yeah, project. Worth Check taking it out. a look. Yeah. yeah. Greg Thompson emailed in about the Balsamic interface mockup software we mentioned in episode 16. I was interested in your discussion about developers using graphical tools to generate mock-ups. You mentioned the program Balsamic a few times, so I decided to check it out. I was rather surprised to find that Balsamic is not free software. A quick search for an alternative led me to the Firefox add-on Pencil. Ooh. Hmm. I did have a very quick look at this, and it's actually pretty good. I mean, I had, didn't try using it or anything, but it seemed to have quite a lot of things that you could drag onto the canvas and mock up with and then i ran out of time to look at it i'll certainly take a look at it um, yeah i mean it sounds like it might not have some of the things that balsamic has like the ability to say add your own icons and mm. um you know have it actually interact when you click on a link it can change to a different mock-up but i don't know i'll have to have a look and find out if it does that because otherwise it's uh sounds pretty good yeah, I think Greg has a fair point that we didn't actually say that Balsamic is, no, is it's, commercial it's proprietary commercial. software. Although, yeah. apparently, if you're a do-gooder, which they do include in that definition uh, open source contributors, they'll give you a free license. They certainly gave me one. All right. All right. Okay, they'll cool. They'll also give you, a f- I think, one or two free licenses if you go and present about it somewhere. Yes. And if, you're a, <laughs> if you teach it's computing nice. and you want to use it with your students, they'll give you licenses for in your entire class. Wow. So okay. they certainly seem to get the open source thing. They just don't use it. Mm. interesting because um about a year ago canonical sent out a mail accidentally to basically everyone on this big mailing list which was a link to get a free copy of balsamic <laughs> and uh yeah that got retracted pretty quickly yeah because mpt Oops. uses it he mentioned it when we interviewed yeah. him yeah i think he really likes the, the fact that he can do a mock-up that doesn't lead you to believe that it's anywhere it's near done yeah, yeah. <laughs> John commented on our live show from Dublin, saying, Dense philosophical discussions about freedom are dull and depressing. Let's get back to the light, fun format that made this show a success. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. Did he not hear the boarding pass story? I mean, that you couldn't get any more light-hearted and fun than that. Yeah. And Dave was wearing flip-flops. Yeah. You know, that's l- fun and light-hearted. Yeah. Yeah. He has a point. <laughs> well, it's difficult when you've got a, an audience in front of you. You can't necessarily do um, the same things as we do in our normal show. Um, mm-hmm. We tried to do that uh, in Dublin, really, for the first time. So it's yeah. quite interesting to see how. Yeah, how and it's over. difficult because none of us are, you know, professional radio artists. So you yeah. know, we're kind of winging it just a little bit. <laughs> that's always the fallback position. <laughs> yes, yeah. we haven't got a clue what we're doing. That's our excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like the philosophical stuff. Really, <clears throat> anybody can read out the news. Yeah, sometimes we can't actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, getting into the more the details of some of these debates is actually more interesting than just sort of saying what it is. And indeed, one of the dense philosophical discussions was about performance-limited processors, and Ehud wrote to say... Any processor manufactured today will, at most, be the cutting edge of what we can produce today. A locked processor will underperform by, to today's standards. When you unlock it in four years' time, there'll be better processors in the market which will cost less. Secondly, it will need to have the same hardware as an unlocked chip and will take the same man hours to develop, or even more, since the lockdown mechanisms require development too. If anything, the lockdown chip will cost as a full-blown card costs today, and unlocking will make the price much higher. Even if the first few cycles, Intel and the ones who follow, will portray this as a cheaper card, in the long run, the margin will narrow and eventually will pay more. John's on to something. Sorry, uh, Ehud? No, John. <laughs> oh, I see, oh, sorry, yeah, I'm with you, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I sort of know what he means. I mean, you were talking about, you know, re-enabling old hardware and stuff, but, you know, a four-year-old processor, even with a bit of a speed boost, is still going to be a four-year-old processor. Yeah, it's a fair point. And uh, Sorin Silagi said, I highly doubt that if a shop charges $50 to switch on the hype threading on a processor, then that means that I'm basically getting a $50 discount by choosing to go with the locked version. 
the way I see this whole thing is like when you go to McDonald's and they say, would you like the extra large one? It's only 30 cents more. And by that, I mean, it's just marketing designed to prey on customer behavior. Yeah, I think I, I, someone has a habit of writing us very long emails, but I, I, I think I agree with this little bit that I pulled out from his email. Um, it is, it seems like that kind of, you know, do you want to supersize? Do you want to go large with that? Yeah. yeah. To me, that's my big worry about it. But yeah, it's interesting. Kind of nobody seems to be thoroughly in favour of it. Everybody seems to be quite sceptical. That it's I written was into the relatively show. in favour. Yeah, you were in the show, but the feedback we've had, I think, has been kind of mostly sceptical. Mm-hmm. So there's obviously a fair amount of scepticism out there in the big wide world. And finally, we had an email from Marvel Shigama in Zimbabwe. Your podcast is great. I just stumbled on it recently and I downloaded all the episodes and I'm learning so much from them. I'm working on season one and season three, so I won't have to play catch up all the time. I like the discussions you had on pronunciation, Ubuntu is Ubuntu Linux, Linux. I am writing Linux. <laughs> I'm writing this from Zimbabwe, so I know how Ubuntu should be pronounced, but Linux, Linux, and Zubuntu, ex-Ubuntu, dot, dot, dot. Mm. Thanks. That's very wow. kind of you to email in. And, um, yeah, we're really sorry you're having to listen through all of those other episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's making him do it. He wants yeah, to do well, it. Voluntarily, yes. It is great to have emails from, from everybody who listens around the world. It yeah. really is fantastic. And to, to know we've got uh, listeners out in Zimbabwe is brilliant. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great to uh, if you could email it back in, perhaps, and tell us how you use Ubuntu and whether how you, you use pronounce it. Linux. Yeah, how you pronounce Linux, <laughs> but no, perhaps you know, say how you how you use Ubuntu, whether you use it at work or at college or university or whatever it is you're doing. That'd be really interesting to find out. And that's all of your feedback. Thank you for listening, and you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, which is podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And you can find uh, voicemail numbers, Twitter, Identica, our Facebook groups on there, um, and all sorts of things um, to find out how to get in touch with us. Let us know what you think of the show, or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Yeah, thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. See you later. Bye. 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 Ian Lane.